Well, good afternoon. My name is Rich Harvey, CEO and founder of propertybuyer.com.au and welcome to our webinar this afternoon. Uh, thank you so much for joining us and spending time. I'd like to introduce Terry Ryder, Managing Director of Hotspotting. Welcome, Terry. Hello, Rich. Always good to be here. We always have such good discussions when we get together on these webinars. I have to say also, we always get really strong numbers mm. to webinars that uh, feature you and Property Buyer. I think um, you're obviously a very popular presenter. Or you have a good track record and presenting good information mm. uh, based on all your years of experience uh, in the in the property industry. Mm, thanks, Terry. And, and likewise, I mean your your name is respected well, both in the media and through independent reporting. So it's it's great to partner up with you for today. So I I chose this topic, Terry, because um, we're coming into an era of higher interest rates. So we've obviously had you know, a lot of interest rate rises in the past 12 months, cash rates now 4.1%, and there's still the threat of another one or two rate rises. And a lot of investors uh, are worried about their yield. So I thought, let's do a discussion about yield. How important is yield? A lot of investors are chasing yield, and let's have a general discussion. So, Terry, just to kick things off, um, we haven't got a lot of slides today, everyone. So this is going to be more a general discussion around some key questions, and we would love your participation as well. So if you do have a question during today, uh, please just write it in the Q&A box down below, and we will be having an open time for at least 20 minutes at the end of the webinar to address all your questions. We'll see if we can answer a couple on the way through if we have time. Um, we do have a couple of slides. Terry, I know you've got some locations to share, uh, and I've got some particular strategies to share with everyone around how to obtain high yields from properties. But before we kick off, Terry, just uh, I guess my first question that we can both discuss is how would you describe or characterise the property market right now? What's the mood of the property markets that we're seeing in Australia at the moment? Look, it's um, surprising a lot of people. A lot of big bank economists are very surprised about how strong the property market is right now, particularly in terms of price trends. Um, I think one of the characteristics is that we're not seeing the same level of sales happening at the moment, but I think primarily that's because we have a shortage of, well, we've got a shortage of everything that's important in real estate at the moment, including a shortage of listings of properties for sale. Various reasons for that, while vendors are, are reluctant to list for sale, but um, notwithstanding that, we still have prices are rising in most jurisdictions across the country. Um, not boom time growth, mm. certainly not like 2021, um, thank goodness, it's probably a better market for everybody when that's not happening. Mm. Um, but we do have we do have growth, and that surprised a lot of observers um, because they had assumed that because interest rates had risen so often that that would dampen the market. But we believe at what's pointing that what's happening with interest rates isn't necessarily the prime determinant of what trends in the market. There are other forces mm. which are more powerful than that, and uh, shortages probably. Um, the single word that can encapsulate everything that's important at the moment um, in the market. So it's um, mm. it's an interesting market that's uh, showing more growth than uh, we were led to believe we should be expecting. Mm. Yeah, I think you're right, Terry. A lot of people just focus on interest rates as the predeterminate driver of the market, and it's certainly a significant factor. Um, but if you study economics and particularly property economics, you'll know that it's only one factor affecting both supply and demand. And the biggest factors I'm seeing out there at the moment in the market um, is that there's a Mexican standoff between vendors withholding their properties from sale, um, but a very significant demand. So there's a you know, very significant undersupply. There's actually a structural undersupply coming, Terry, in the market. We've got 400,000 migrants coming into the country this year, potentially another 300 to 350 next year, and around another 250 the year after. So potentially almost a million people in the next you know, three to three and a half years. Now, there's a huge challenge is that we're not building enough properties to keep up with demand. Building approvals need to be about 180 to 160,000. Um, we're currently probably sitting at about 120,000 to be built this year. So the next five years, we're going to be heading into what I call a structural undersupply situation. So great news if you're an investor, difficult news if you're a, um, a renter. Um, and that's why for me, being an ex-economist, I always look at the numbers and go, where are the best areas of significant undersupply? Um, and we're obviously seeing pretty significant vacancy rates, even in our capital cities. I mean, the vacancy rate has eased uh, a little bit, according to SQM's latest numbers. 
but you know the average vacancy at 1.3 percent is still um it's still a very very challenging market at the moment Terry. well that's right i mean but they haven't e eased much have they a year ago it was 1.2 and now it's 1.3 <laughs> whereas a balanced market is considered to be mm. 2.5 mm. or 3 percent mm. um so yes but you're right we have we have a structural shortage we haven't been building enough new dwellings mm. and um all sorts of reasons for that um cleaning problems that currently exist in the building industry um so it's, it's probably not going to get better from the tenancy viewpoint anytime soon mm. which means as you point out it's an advantageous time for investors to be considering getting in mm. and i guess the thing that we're going to talk about today at length is that um, even though interest rates have risen and it might seem a bit daunting there are um, solutions to that uh, conundrum and that is the um, mm. question of yield yeah i think just uh, before we jump into yield just a couple other points that i'd like to make about the market and one is just around financing um, both home owners and, uh, and investors at the moment is that we're seeing that if an investor or a home buyer gets a pre-approval from their lender, they've got 90 days to find a property before they need to reapply. And potentially after that 90 days, if they haven't secured a property, their pre-approval borrowing capacity might be slightly lower. So they might have a million dollars today to go and borrow something. But in 90 days time, if you get another rate rise or another two rate rises, it might drop by another 20, 30, $40,000. So what we're seeing at auctions, um, and I'm sure you know about this, Terry, is that there's really a hard stop when people are bidding on properties or negotiating on properties. There's, there's a significant limitation um, if they're using borrowed funds to buy properties. Um, for the retirees and those downsizing, they're generally more cashed up, paid off their mortgage. But the first home buyers, the upgraders, you know, the middle of the market, uh, that area is, is definitely, it's more challenging to buy a property. Uh, and that's why it's also very important if you are looking to buy a property, you do your research well and you do it quickly and efficiently if you can, because there's lots of other people also competing for the same kinds of properties. Um, the other thing just to address, Terry, is this issue of the fiscal cliff, right? And there's a lot of discussion around, are we going to see the market really crash in September, October, when all these supposed properties come on the market. Now, my view is um, there will be some more distressed selling, um, but I don't think there'll be massive widespread, you know, delinquencies everywhere. Certainly the delinquency rate will rise, but I don't think there's going to be a major fallout in the whole property market. And in fact, prices, I think, will continue to rise, but they won't rise nearly as fast as they did during COVID, just at a much more sustainable rate, Terry. Yeah, yeah, I think so. The media loves to talk about cliffs. They were talking about one during during the COVID period, um, and you know, it didn't arrive. And one of the reasons for that is that the the banking industry doesn't want the problem of major delinquencies, and and they react accordingly. It's in their own vested interest to have policies in place to deal with that situation, which they, you know they can see coming, um, and that will be one of the mitigating factors. Um, so um, we're always um, seeing you know banks starting to change their stance in a number of areas in recognition of some of the forces in play, including higher interest rates, mm. and, and that you know we've got that three percent buffer in the and some of them are, are starting to relax that, for example, yep. um, from three mm. percent down to two percent perhaps, mm. um, because otherwise they'll be disqualifying people who mm. um, would otherwise be valid uh, borrowers um, mm. by the real estate. Mm. Well, Terry, let's jump into the topic on yield. So my first question for you is, why is yield so important when selecting an investment property? What's the significance of yield in your mind? Well, it's become more important because interest rates are higher, therefore the, the costs of ownership are higher. Um, um, and, and yields, a uh, good high yield simply means that you've got a better chance of covering the cost of ownership. Um, when interest rates were close to zero, it wasn't so much of a factor but now of course interest rates are higher um, people have become a lot more yield conscious um, and um, I think the good news is that there are, are plenty of options uh, where people can find high yielding properties without taking high risk and that's um, essentially what our topic is today. Mm, yeah I think um, if we look at the definition of yield too Terry um, and what yield represents it, it represents what it's what the income and the return that the investment is delivering on a cash basis. 
So what it yields, like a crop, when you throw a seed in the ground, how much fruit, how much grain is it producing? When you've got a property, how much cash is it throwing off? That's that's what the yield indicates. And um, yield is often used as a measure of risk as well. So often it used to be thought of that high yield properties equaled high risk properties, but that's not necessarily the case. Uh, we'll be talking more about the pros and cons of high yield versus low yield properties as we go through today. But it is really important if you're an investor to understand gross yield and net yield and how sustainable the yield is. Um, so you've got to do a lot of research around the rentals in an area and look at the vacancy rate, look at the employment drivers of a local area. Because I remember Terry many, many years ago when I used to present at a lot of the property expos, I'd get all of the traditional spruikers coming up to me and saying, Rich, you've got to put your clients into Port Hedland and Carafa. You've got to put them into these giant mining towns. You know, we can you can buy a house there for $1.2 million and get a 10% yield. I'm going, yeah, nice yield, but the purchase price is, is just too high relative to its long-term value. And sure enough, those properties a couple of years later declined by about 50% in value and went down from 1.2 down to 600,000 with major vacancies because of the mining cycle at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, so you've got to be very careful, not only get a good yield, but preserve your capital and grow your capital um, when you're doing property selection. So there's quite a few things to, to consider there. Mm -hmm. um, but Terry, tell me why you think the banks want high yield. What's, what's the significance of yield to a lender? Well, I think um, a high yield uh, is an indication to the lender that the, the borrower is going to be able to, to cover, cover the costs of owning the property and therefore it's going to be a lower risk to the lender. Um, other, you know, if, if a, uh, an investor is buying a property and yield is only 2 or 3%, such as if they're buying in a, maybe a, one of the more expensive capital cities, um, they're going to have to be putting in some of their own income mm. uh, each week or month to, to service the ownership of that property. Mm. So um, they're buying, in, on the other hand, in a location where they're getting a 6 or 7% uh, gross yield better chance that they'll be able to cover all the costs and therefore not be under any financial pressure in owning mm. that property. And that, that gives comfort to the, mm. uh, to the lender. Mm. I think um, serviceability ratios, and you mentioned buffers before, are very significant. If you talk to your broker or to your bank, um, the more serviceability you've got, um, the much happier the banks are to lend you more money. If you've got a very highly negatively geared portfolio, um, and, and the rents are nowhere covering anywhere near the repayments, then you're going to be unable to then borrow more money. Um, so really, it's, it's critical that when you have borrowing capacity that you use it. Um, I mean, it depends on what your job. If you've got a stable PAY job, then that's great. But if you've got a, 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 an income that fluctuates, really you need to work hard to get your income up those years. And then when you've got the capacity, go for it and make sure you buy a property with a good solid yield. So it becomes almost a set and forget style investment. Yeah. Um, that's what I've tried to do in my own portfolio. And I'll give some examples of what I've bought personally later in the presentation. Yeah. But Terry, talking about constructing a portfolio, I didn't give you this question. I've just thought of another one is when you're building a portfolio, it's really important from my perspective to get a good balance of growth properties and higher yield properties. So when you're starting out, um, it's really important, particularly your very first property, it's got to be the leap. It's got to be the foundation stone to leveraging your wealth to buy more properties. The worst thing you can do is buy, you know, a negatively geared property in a low growth area. That's the worst thing you can do because that's going to hold you back for decades. Yeah. If you can buy a high growth property at a reasonable yield, not necessarily a high yield, but then get some equity to then leverage that as a deposit for your next property, that's great. And as you buy more properties, go for higher yield but really try to balance out that portfolio. And there's a lot of factors I'm talking about here, Terry, because it's going to depend on what age and stage you're at in your life. If you're at a young age and you're in that accumulation phase, then, you know, without giving financial advice, for me personally, what I did was, was I spent the money on paying lenders mortgage insurance. When I got a 20% deposit, I chop it in half and I put 10% on each property. Um, I was really trying to leverage myself quite highly when I was starting off, but I knew that my job was stable and I could do that. That won't suit everybody. Um, for other people in our current climate, when we've got high interest rates, the yield is going to be a critical factor for determining for you holding on to that property. And I've seen examples of people I know personally who are freaking out at the moment, worried about their mortgage repayments and really talking about selling their investment properties. 
And that's a really sad situation or a difficult situation if you're there because you know, the transaction costs to actually get the property in the first place, and then if you sell it and then to buy back in again, you're losing six or seven percent of the capital value. So what's your advice, Terry, on portfolio construction, getting the right balance? Yeah, look, I think a lot of what you say, I would absolutely agree with, particularly the point where it's so important to get your first one right, because it's the foundation for the second one and then the third one. But if you make a bad choice with your first one, you may never get beyond one property. And the stats show that most people don't get beyond one or two properties. Mm. All right, less than 1% of those who own investment properties actually have a portfolio of five or more properties. Mm. And that's why I always say to people, um, you've got to build your team before you build your portfolio. I think this, is, um, this may well be the most important message of all today is that to make sure you get those early uh, property decisions right to build the foundation to create a portfolio, you really need to have around you uh, experts in a, a range of fields, a good accountant, um, good advice on structure that you need to buy in, um, good re access to good research information, a good mortgage broker, um, engage a good buyer's agent to, to, to make sure that you buy a good property in a good location and get the right property at the right price. Um, and be willing to invest a little bit of money in all of that because your outcomes will be much better if you do that. So many people try to attempt property investment in a penny-pinching way, not willing to invest in research and advice, and it's a false economy. Um, and I think that's the main reason why there's so few people go on to build a substantial portfolio because they make that mistake in the beginning. Mm. And it's all about using your both your income, borrowing capacity, and your capital really efficiently. You know, you, you know, I've seen people on 75, 80 grand a year build really good portfolios um, compared to someone on 200K who just spends their money on, on stupid stuff or depreciates their assets like jet skis and televisions. So it's really important that you get the right team around you to buy the right quality of property and understand that property is a great financial discipline um, because if you don't spend your money on property, you'll spend it on something else, guaranteed. So, um, so Terry, let's talk about the rising rental market. We've obviously seen significant rises in rents and we've seen like anywhere from a 10 to 15% rise in rents across different cities and locations last year. Um, what's your view on how much further rents could rise from here? Well, from the viewpoint of vacancies, um, rents um, can continue to rise. Um, there's no solution in sight to the shortage. There's not a politician in Australia that's presented a viable solution to the key problem, which is the shortage. We've got some uh, political um, commentators, some portions of politics suggesting what we need is a rental cap. And of course, that's going to make the problem worse, not better. It's, it's not addressing the fundamental problem, which is the shortage. And given that there are no solutions being presented by any of our politicians, the shortage will continue and therefore there's pressure, upward pressure on rents. Where there's a limiting factor is just the market's capacity to pay more and more. Um, whereas you could argue that when it comes to the, the sale market, people buying property, theoretically, there's, there's no upper limit to what uh, where prices can go over time. But there's a there's more of a limit over where rents can go because people renting property tend to be at the, the, um, the lower income end of um, the community. Not always, but I guess most people are renting are renting because um, they have to rent, they can't afford to buy. Um, and that means that they are limited by income and how much they can pay in rent. So I think there, uh, there are some landlords who are being a little bit foolish. They're um, pricing themselves out of the market by saying, okay, there's a big shortage, I can put my rent up to whatever I want, and they lose their tenant. Um, I think there's value in, in holding a good tenant uh, because if you lose your tenant, you've got to, you've got a period of vacancy while you have, and costs while you re-tenant the property. Mm. It doesn't always make sense to mm. try and squeeze the last drop of rent out of the market. There's value in keeping a good tenant in place. Mm. So there is that, that, that ceiling, I think, um, mm. that limitation on just how high rents can go. Mm. Yeah. I think um, some of the proposed solutions um, are pretty short-sighted for, um, particularly you mentioned rental caps, uh, which is advocated by, I believe, the Greens policy. Um, mm. Unfortunately, that won't solve anything. It's like trying to put a lid on boiling water. It will always find a way out or before it explodes. Um, I think the key 
policies need to be encouraging more private individuals to invest in rental property. Um, the government's shown if they try to provide too much rental accommodation, it's too slow to be built and it's not in the right areas. But I think incentivising the average investor to do it is good. Um, uh, we've seen in Queensland, the government introduce a policy where you can only increase your rent once a year. Um, I mean, that's fine. I don't think that's really going to impact property investors too badly. I mean, normally, as you say, you want to keep your tenant long term and doing annual reviews is, is fine. You don't really need to do them every six months. Just make sure you get an appropriate rent set um, and give your tenant plenty of notice if you are going to increase it. But as you say, look after your tenant and make sure that they're looking after the place. So it's a, it's a mutual partnership. You've got to work together. Um, there has been proposals for some rents to be linked to inflation. Um, but the funny thing is that rents make up a very significant portion of the CPI basket. So it's a bit of a circular argument, that one, you know. But it is. But also, you know, we, we cannot single out this commodity uh, um, uh, to the exclusion of all other commodities. Mm. Prices for a lot of things are rising because they're, you know, for various factors in play, but shortage is, is, a, is a key factor. Mm. The, the costs for people who own real estate are rising. Interest rates have risen, insurances have risen, council rates have risen, land taxes have risen. All the costs of owning property have increased. You cannot then say to the people, you can't increase your price hmm. because it becomes untenable See. and that will force um, investors to sell and then we'll have an even bigger shortage and so there's all we get more upward pressure on rents mm. so we have to, we can't single out real estate um we have to have, apply um we live in a, a market economy we have to allow those forces to be in play what we need to do is deal with the fundamental problem which is the shortage mm. and there are solutions though there are actually simple solutions in play politicians are tying themselves and not talking about building millions of new homes the solution is far simpler than that you have to provide encouragement to property investors, not discouragement. Right now we're demonising mm. property investors and scapegoating. They're mm. not the problem, they're the solution, given exactly. that 90, more than 90% of the properties that people rent in Australia are provided by mm. private investors, not by government. Mm. And uh, there's no way that government can replace that supply. We're talking about trillions of dollars if they tried. Mm. See, that's not tenable. So yeah. we need to encourage people, including foreign investors. I mean, there's mm. a bit of a debate about that. We effectively, we didn't ban foreign investors, but we effectively did some years ago by slugging them with a whole range of new taxes and fees and charges um, because it was decided to scapegoat them for poor affordability. Of course, they weren't the problem at all. What, what we've done is reduce the supply of apartments um, that were built because mm. those, those projects were aligned on selling a certain facilities percentage of their pre-sales mm. to foreign investors before they could get finance to build. So a lot of projects mm. didn't happen. That's one of the big reasons why we have the shortage. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Spot on, Terry. Um, yeah, you should be um, you should be a politician, mate. You've got all the answers. Um, <laughs> um, question for you again, I'll help to answer this one is, is it possible to find both a high yield and a high growth property or yeah. are they mutually exclusive? No, they're not at all. I think that's one of the beauties of, of the rental, I'm oh, sorry, the investment market uh, for people who want to get into the market as investors at the moment. It's kind of a win-win situation there. Um, you can buy affordable property um, with high rental yields in areas where it's going to show really good growth because what we've been seeing, certainly in the last few years, is that the areas that are showing the best capital growth have been those the smaller capital cities, which are cheaper than the big ones, and many of the regional markets, which again are more affordable than uh, the big cities. So um, we have an equation that's actually quite attractive to investors that you can buy in affordable areas um, at high yields than you would get in the biggest cities and still have great prospects for growth because those are the markets that are uh, strongest at the moment. So you can have the best of all worlds if you select your location carefully. Um, mm, mm, brilliant. Um, Terry, we might well, just jump into a couple of slides. Um, what I might do is, before we go to locations, um, what I might do is just share a couple of examples, uh, if I may, just around the types of properties that um, are potentially uh, available for. Um, I've just got to do it in presentation, mate. Just give me one sec. And I'll go to here. Got to get the screens right. And I'll go to screen number two. 
Cool. Is that showing up there okay, Terry? Yep. No, that's fine. Yep. Okay. So, um, so what we're seeing a couple of case studies. So I just want to go through a couple of case studies here um, just to show that you can buy high growth and high yield properties. They aren't mutually exclusive. So these are a couple of examples of properties that um, my team and myself have bought in the last couple of years. Um, this is an example of a, a standard house. This is um, in Brisbane, uh, a middle to outer ring suburb of Brisbane, which I think this is actually in Springfield. Um, we had an investor client with a budget of around 900K and we were targeting um, good quality properties that, that will provide, you know, a, at the time when we bought it um, with the so March 22, because interest rates were back when lower then, we provide positive cash flow at the time. So it was, this property was listed without a price, four bed, two bath, two car. And we actually interestingly managed to secure this at $40,000 lower than another offer on the table. So the agent had an offer of, a, um, of, of 935, but they went with our particular buyer because we offered um, a shorter settlement time and more confirmed and guaranteed terms to actually get the deal done. Um, and as you know, buying in Queensland, Terry, it's a little bit easier to get out of contracts if you don't get finance approval and valuation doesn't stack up. So um, our, our buyer was able to secure this. Now this uh, property, uh, since we bought it, has gone up almost 21% and the rental growth has gone up 18%. So at the time when we bought it for the client, it was appraised at 930 a week, but now we're actually getting 1,020 a week. Uh, it was achieved at the time when we leased it, and now it's, it's obviously gone up even more since then. So at the time we bought it, almost a 6% yield, 5.93. So that was a, a good quality good quality buy in a, in a high growth suburb. So that's, that's an interesting one, uh, Rich. Mm. Um, I assume we're talking about like a permanent rental situation. Right, this is a long-term rental, yeah. And I mean, it's, I think um, it, it so puts the lower to the uh, the assumption that if you buy it around nine hundred or a million, you're going to get a lower rental yield, which is which, which is often the case. Mm. But uh, a property like this, renting for like over a thousand dollars a week, um, you're still getting a six percent uh, gross yield, which is mm. which is excellent for mm. a, a high-priced property. I mean, one of the reasons we chose this area, it's got a higher proportion of owner-occupiers to investors. I think the ratio is about 80-20 to owner-occupier-investor um, compared to some suburbs that you know, Terry, like Parramatta or something, they've got millions of two-bedroom units and there's 50% investors in there. So that's another trick to the trade is if you can buy in areas that got a high percentage of owner-occupiers where there's a limited pool of properties on the rental market. Yes. Um, the next one I've got is a slightly different strategy, and this is buying apartments for holiday letting or short-term rentals. So this was one we bought on the Gold Coast. Normally, I'm not a big fan of this, but um, this is a really good example of something that does work. So we found this one uh, just near Service Paradise, Broad Beach. Um, we got this off market through one of our agent contacts. We bought it for $6.55, including all of the furniture. So the rent, um, uh, is is fourteen ninety five a week, um, and it's delivering a pretty strong occupancy rate. Like a lot of the uh, holiday lets, you only get around sixty percent. Uh, this one's over eighty percent. So you've got to make sure that you're buying apartments in really high demand areas. So, for example, um, the sunny coast is is unfortunately it's a poor, a lovely spot, but it's a poor cousin compared to the Gold Coast in terms of a a more continuous destination for tourists and holiday makers. Anyway, we um, managed to get a, a gross yield of 11.8%, uh, sorry, actual rent, uh, a gross yield of 13%, so above what we estimated. Um, and the actual net yield we got on after one year was 9.7%. And, and importantly, Terry, again, proving the theory, um, we got really strong growth. So this, this um, capital growth in this area has gone up 36% in the last 18 months as well. So significant opportunity there. And it's an interesting view of an alternative strategy mm. uh, to the standard uh, permanent let, uh, how you can uh, significantly lift your, your yield. Mm. Uh, I mean, a net yield of 8%, a gross yield of 12 or 13 is tremendous. Mm. Uh, I guess it, it's worth mentioning that you will have uh, more management fees. Um, you will have... Right wear and tear on your property because it's a holiday let. Mm. Nevertheless, just based on that return that you're getting on investment, that's a pretty good outcome. Yeah. 
So Terry, the next one, I just moved to two granny flat examples. Um, and these are two that I've bought personally. I bought this property during the GFC um, in 2008 um, on, the, on Sydney's Northern Beaches. I paid 850,000 for a three bedroom house with an already constructed granny flat behind the garage. Um, there's nothing much to write home about. Classic, you know, late 1960s post-war red brick home. Um, we spent a fair bit of money renovating the inside. We actually converted into a four bedroom house by covering in part of the, um, the balcony area at the back and we renovated the granny flat. In fact, what I did the other a uh, couple of years ago, I actually subdivided the granny flat in from one bedroom to two bedrooms and increased the rental as well. Anyway, um, at now at the time when I bought it, it rented for $750 a week. It now rents for $1690 a week as a total package. Um, yeah. Got it valued last year at $2.4. So it made one and a half million bucks. So if you look at the yield on what I originally paid for it, <laughs> it's fantastic, a 10% yield. Uh, if you base the yield on its current valuation, it's only 3.6%. But it's been a great performer, hardly ever vacant. Um, it's an affordable rental in a suburb that's got very high demand for rentals. Again, the 80-20 rule. Um, so we've been really happy with this one. Yeah, and that makes a very, very valid point and one that, that I like to make to people when I'm having conversations about considering investing and what the yield is. Um, don't just consider the yield on the day that you buy it. Think about what the yield might be in one or two years' time because we are in a, a market where there's serious upward pressure on rentals. And a um, if you factor in a 10% rental increase, you're actually being quite conservative in many locations in the current climate. Mm. So... Um, if you're starting out with a five and a half or six percent rental yield, um, think about what it might be in a couple of years' time. It might be um, seven, seven and a half percent with rental increases. And that's starting to look very comfortable mm -hmm. and uh, helping you to be uh, positive cash flow um, and setting you up for more purchases. Mm -hmm. So, Terry, the next one's another um, granny flat. I, I really like the granny flat strategy, so I liked it so much I did another one. So, I bought this one last year at Yamina Beach on the central coast of New South Wales. Um, I found this off market through one of my contacts. Um, it had been partially renovated, but we did another $30,000 reno on the inside, just repainting, recarpeting, fixing up damaged walls and bits and pieces. Um, and in this particular area, most of the block size is around 500 square metres. Um, but this particular block is 750 square metres. So it enabled us to have a fantastic backyard where we can build a granny flat and both the current house and the granny flat are still going to get a good size yard. Um, anyway, the flat costs me 230 grand. It's going to be finished in about uh, middle of August. Um, I'm renting the front house out for 795 a week and I'll rent the flat out the back for 575 a week, um, which will give me a total gross yield of 6%. And the other little kicker is that um, I'll get uh, an, an uplift in the valuation as well. And I'll just show you one more little thing about this one, which is pretty cool trick to the trade to know. Um, there's pretty strict granny flat legislation around the size of granny flats. And most people would know you can only build a 60 square metre granny flat. But what you're able to do with my particular granny flat provider is still get occupation certificate. I've actually built a three bedroom granny flat by converting the garage into another habitable area. Um, so I don't know if you can actually see here on, on this particular uh, slide, but you'll see there the second bathroom, it says dog grooming, right? So this particular dog grooming area will become an ensuite after handover. So um, what we do is we don't put in the shower screen, we just build a little spot where the shower tap will poke through the wall and we do that after handover. And I'll be building a wall in the garage there just near the roller door to create storage. But I'll be able to get 96 square metres under roof, which is the same as a three bedroom house. Um, and that way I'll have a, a really nice granny flat. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great illustration of the possibilities. Um, mm. uh, with the, when you think outside the square, um, it's, a, it's a combination of strategies, which um, is partly a value adding strategy um, mm. to increase your um, the rental yield. And I think we're going to talk more about those kind of strategies a little bit later in the broadcast. Mm. So um, the next one is a duplex. So if you don't want to build, you can just buy something existing. Um, and a duplex like this, again, this is in a, a middle ring suburb of Brisbane. Um, it should actually say 5.67%, not dollars. It's a typo there. Um, but we bought this one for 770,000, about 30K under uh, what we believe was the, was the market price at the time. 
Um, and that particular suburb has seen a 26.85% growth um, pretty much in the last 18 months. So, you know, um, again, that, that's delivering a pretty decent yield. Um, but if you don't want the hassle of building, you can just buy something that's like a set and forget style investment. They're getting two incomes from the one property. And that's a good recession proof strategy. Yeah. Um, another strategy that uh, I want to talk about, which is unique to Brisbane, is, is really talking about rooming houses. Um, some people know about this, others don't. It's, it's sort of a, it's being promoted quite a lot. Um, but this strategy, you can do it with existing uh, freestanding homes. You can actually convert it into an in rent out individual rooms. Or the example I'm going to show here is just building from scratch and building a brand new purpose-built rooming house. And you'll end up getting a yield of over 8%, maybe even up to 9% has been what, what you can do. So this is the internal area. It's basically like a five-bedroom house. Uh, it's a little bit hard to read this floor plan, but there's, as you walk in, there's a common area and a common, common kitchen area here. Um, and then each room has its own bedroom, its own ensuite, and its own kitchenette. So each of the individual rooms, like a mini hotel in a way, where it's got its own bedroom and own living space. Um, and also each of these, off each of these rooms is a separate little outdoor area. A lot of them are the newer ones, newer versions that we're looking at have a sliding door out to an outdoor area as well to add extra value. Now, these rooms will rent out, we, we budget around $350 a week, but in actual fact, they're getting somewhere between $380 to even $400 a week in rent, just simply because of the shortage of rentals in the key areas. And again, we don't do these in the outer suburbs. We typically do them in the middle ring suburbs of Brisbane. Um, and I'll just show you some of the costings on this one. So you typically need to have about about a million to 1.2 million is your all up cost of land and build. Um, you now we, you'll be paying water, electricity um, and NBN access. So you as the owner of the property cover those extras. Um, you've got gardening, cleaning, insurance, pests and all that and your management fees. So when you add all of those annual costs up, you're getting 88,000 roughly in rent, 24,000 in costs, but you're getting $64,000 a year in rental return. So it's just over 6% net, which is a fantastic result for, for that kind of property. The other thing, Terry, is um, the real kicker as well on this one is because you're building with new, the depreciation is through the roof. So you've got um, around you know, $116,000 of plant and equipment depreciation over the life, effective life of the, um, the, the building. But in the first year, depreciation is $48,000. So if someone's on a good income um, and you want a positive cash flow property, this is a no-brainer strategy. Um, I'd love to have six of these in my portfolio. Uh, I'd be very happy with these. Mm. Yeah. I did a, a webinar uh, a year or so ago with a, a building company in Queensland that was specialising in developing this kind of property um, because the, they saw growing demand for this. And it was sort of, you can operate them at, two opposite ends of the market. Um, it might be suitable for like students attending university, mm. uh, just looking for an affordable room to rent in that sort of share house situation, or at the other end of the spectrum, uh, retirees um, who are able to um, access, you know, th this kind of property at an affordable rental um, as a, an attractive alternative to, mm. well, you know, not being able to afford to rent a, full house themselves and this is a as a great compromise um, from a from a social as well as a financial viewpoint exactly yeah yeah well, i think you provide by doing this you're providing answers to um a lot of the social housing problems as well yeah. um terry just the last couple of slides for me is uh, on examples is is commercial and we'll talk a bit about the the risk of commercial versus resi a bit later but just here's a couple of examples of um, some properties we've bought for clients in the last 12 18 months this is one we bought up on the Central Coast um, near Morissette. Um, we found this again uh, off market for our client, purchased for $4 million, rents for $242,000 a year. I mean, these numbers are not necessarily for your average investor, but a more sophisticated investor who understands this kind of risk. But the amazing thing was we were able to negotiate a seven plus seven year lease. Most commercial leases are five plus five or three plus three, but to get a seven plus seven with a 3.25% per annum increase every year uh, for the next 14 years, 
This is an absolute set and forget type property. This is perfect. Um, with a high quality international tenant, this would be, you know, again, love to have one of these in my super fund if I could. Um, another one to show you is something else we bought. Uh, this was for an owner occupier, actually, not so much an investor. Uh, we bought this one off market in Bankstown for a uh, lovely Chinese lady who ran a stone cutting business. Um, her staff and her business was growing quite strongly and needed bigger premises. And um, we bought this and saved her about half a million dollars just simply through negotiating well. And the last one we've got is a slightly lower yield for commercial, but really strong upside. Anything in the industrial side of, of commercial is in very, very high demand. So we're seeing quite strong yield compression in the industrial sector at the moment. But again, got this one off market, 3.75, sorry, 3.5, uh, three plus three year lease with 4% increases per annum built into the rent. Um, so this is a great both capital growth and strong yield proposition. This particular investor had a fair bit of cash to invest. So even though it's got a lower yield, it's still going to generate him a positive cash flow after all costs. Because uh, in commercial, as you would know, the tenant pays all the outgoings as well. Um, so that's all from me. Um, I will put my details at the end of the presentation, but how do I end slides? Stop share. There we go. Um, so Terry, tell us about some locations. You've got a couple of slides to share about locations on, on where you think we can find uh, positive cash flow investors uh, investments for our clients. Mm -hmm. Okay. So yes, I'll just show half a dozen locations that um, that kind of fit the bill. Um, there's uh, there's no shortage really of of good locations um, around the country. We recently published um, a report, the National Top Ten Positive Cash Flow Hotspots Report, um, and uh, it's quite hard to actually whittle down a list of possibilities of just ten locations around Australia because there are plenty where. Um, you can find uh, probably affordable prices, uh, rental yields five, six percent and higher, uh, but also in locations that have good prospects for capital growth. But one of the criteria is that there are locations where you can buy cheap property with high yields, but they don't have particularly good growth prospects, or they might be high risk locations like uh, mining towns, which we're always at pains to advise people to avoid. So, you know, high yielding locations with um, positive cash flow without high risk. And um, just some of the examples, uh, Geraldton in uh, Western Australia is, is a market that's really starting to come into a growth phase um, and um, still very affordable. It's a really good, strong regional city, the biggest city in Western Australia, north of Perth. It's an important export port. It's a coastal city, obviously, with a, a nice lifestyle, very affordable property. You've got the city of Greater Geraldton, and this is the suburb of Geraldton, where the median price is just a tick over 300,000 typical yields, um, 6.7. 6 that's the median yield, according to Core Logic data, 6.7%. So that's a pretty good start. Um, so we think this area, because of the uh, investment that's going in there, both from the state government and from um, private enterprise, big things are planned and underway for Geraldton. So this is one that we think could be a good buy at affordable prices with um, good rental yields. Um, Murray Bridge in South Australia. South Australia has a number of uh, good possibilities. Adelaide itself, the northern suburbs, still very affordable with uh, good rental yields, 6% and above, which is pretty good for a capital city. But in the regional parts of South Australia, there are uh, regional centres like Mount Gambier. And this one, Murray Bridge, uh, just beyond the Adelaide Hills, um, very affordable, good rental yields, vacancies near zero, uh, good strong local economy with plenty happening. So there's prospects for growth in both prices and uh, rentals there. Um, in Perth itself, still um, the most affordable capital city in Australia. It's, it's um, probably the boom market in Australia right now, Perth, but it has not yet fulfilled its price potential. There's still, I believe, plenty of um, capital growth to come in the Perth market. This is at the lower end of the Perth market. Um, the city of Armadale, which includes a suburb called Armadale. Uh, Armadale is the sort of the CBD of that municipality in the, the south of the greater Perth area. Um, typical prices around the low 300,000s and yields 6 and 7% are common. But it's an area that's got really good amenities and infrastructure, 
a lot of people look at that and think, well, it's really down market. Who'd want to live there? Well, a lot of people do because it is affordable. And it's got great infrastructure, great amenities. You can jump on the train and get to uh, central Perth if you need to or want to pretty quickly and easily. Um, but, um, you know, it's been targeted by both home buyers, first home buyers and investors because of that equation. Um, another possibility in Perth um, is the city of Quinana. Um, these figures are for the suburb of Aurelia, small, it's a very small local government area south of the, the Perth CBD. One of the things we like about Quinana is that it's um, close to really, really big employment zones. There's a big industrial area um, not far from here that uh, employs tens of thousands of people, keeping in mind that um, most people don't work in the CBD, they work in suburban jobs nodes, and this one's close to one of the big ones in Perth. Affordable prices and really good rental yields, and we're, we're seeing great capital growth in this area because it's been targeted for its affordability. And again, it does have really good facilities and amenities, shopping, schools, train links to central Perth, et cetera. Um, in regional Queensland, there's lots of possibilities for good property at affordable prices, high yields, growth prospects throughout regional Queensland. Gatton, a lot of people say, where the hell is Gatton? It's um, quite an important town, a smallish town, but we like it because of its location, which is halfway between two major growth centres, the city of Ipswich, which is the uh, big growth area on the southwestern fringe of Brisbane, and then Toowoomba, which is one of the strongest uh, regional uh, cities, uh, we think, in terms of the property market in Australia at the moment, and getting sort of halfway between. It's got a major university campus there, and it's not far from the big Rafan Millie Air Force Base, so there's lots of jobs in the area, apart from its mainstream, which is agriculture and tourism, and pricing pretty affordable and yields good and strong. And of course, like almost everywhere in Australia, vacancies are below 1%. Hmm. And finally, Bursica, rather an odd name for a, for a place. Berserk, well, it's um, a suburb of uh, Rockhampton, which is one of the growth regional cities of, of Queensland, and central Queensland, very much a growth city, very affordable, lots of infrastructure spending happening. So there's good prospects for growth. This is probably the cheapest suburb. It's full of these big old Queenslanders, probably in need of renovation, but if if you're an investor with a strategy, you want to buy cheap, get a good rental yield and, and maybe do a renovation and add value that way, this is a good place to target. I mean, look look at that equation. Price is under 300,000, yields above 8%. You've got to be careful, though. Like every regional city in Australia that's um, worthy of note, it was built on the banks of a major river and that river has a tendency to flood. That's, that's true of most regional cities in Australia, unfortunately. You've just got to be very mindful of checking the flood maps. Last time there was a big flood in um, Rockhampton. Parts of this suburb did uh, have a flooding issue, but other parts were, were above the flood zone. So you've just got to be very careful you check that. Um, be very, very particular about that so you're buying outside the floodable areas, but otherwise you can access that kind of equation, um, value-adding opportunities at that sort of a price and those yields. But um, Rich, um, we find um, Australia's full of opportunities like that. If you know where to look, um, some of them are in capital cities like Perth and Adelaide, um, but mostly in regional Australia. But if you target um, growth regional centres with you know, strong, diverse economies and um, infrastructure spends underway, there's, there's potential for capital growth as well as um, mm. uh, high rental yields. So, mm. you know, the best of all worlds if you choose your location well. Mm, fantastic. So I'll um, stop my share. That's great, Terry. Look, excellent. Thanks for sharing some ideas. And again, they're not an exhaustive list, but really some really good ones there. Um, really appreciate you sharing that. Just to briefly, just before we go to Q and A, I've got a bunch of questions there. And if you you do um, in the audience there have any questions, just go to the Q and A button at the bottom and fill in your question. We are going to come to those questions very soon. But Terry, just the last discussion point is the risk of residential versus com commercial property investment. What's your take on the risk of resi versus commercial in your view? Um, look, look, I feel that, you know, a, a, obviously a generalisation that um, there are pros and cons, of course, as is the case with all residential feels to me to be safer. Um, 
because um, even though with um, commercial industrial, you can have a, a tenant on a three, five or seven year lease, if um, your tenant, the business goes broke, you, you, you can struggle to, to find a tenant to replace them. Um, it's not as easy as it is in the residential market. Um, with commercial, the capital growth tends to be less than with, with residential, but the uh, the rental yields are higher if you get it right. You can have fantastic positive cash flow situations with good commercial property uh, without a massive outlay in some cases. Um, so, yeah, like everything, there's pros and cons. I feel safer with residential, but I know plenty of people are doing really well by investing in small commercial industrial property, sometimes retail, and getting those wonderful rental returns. Mm. Yeah, a couple of the, the positives with commercial for me is that the tenant pays the outgoings. Yeah. All of the strata fees, the electricity, everything like that is all covered by the tenant. So that's a big saving. That's why you tend to get higher yields in commercial. Uh, also, the length of the lease is often three, five or seven years, and there's often an option to renew. So that longevity is fantastic. Um, yeah. I see a lot of people too buying multiple resi properties and then they'll sell a bunch and then buy one or two commercials to consolidate later in life because they know the cash flow is stronger or better. And they've also got built-in rent increases as well every year. Um, on the negative side or the risk side with the commercial, you've alluded to one of the biggest ones, Terry, and that's vacancy. And we saw during COVID what can happen, particularly like if a retail business goes broke. And we also saw a moratorium on evictions. So if you are a poor investor, highly leveraged into a commercial property and your tenants stop paying the rent, you're in dire straits. You, you, you're in danger of potentially losing not just the asset, but having to fork out a lot of dollars to the bank. So for my view, you do need to have very strong buffers in place if you're going to go down the commercial route. I say to a lot of my clients, you need to buy three, four or more, five resi properties before you consider your first commercial. Um, make sure you've got plenty of equity, plenty of cash buffer before you get into that. And the, the last risk area is, is leverage. Uh, with resi properties, you can do 80, even 90% LBR. Uh, with a commercial property, typically at 65% or usually max 70% as a loan to value ratio. So you need more equity to get into the commercial side of things. So they're just a couple of um, considerations to, to think about. And, and the fact that the lender requires greater equity is an indication of how they see the risk. Correct. Mm. So, Terry, uh, that's been great discussion. Let's jump into the questions here. So, Philip is asking, I'd like to hear your thoughts on SDA, special, Specialist Disability Accommodation. Yeah, I was going to bring this one up with you, Terry. So, there's a big discussion around or, or idea about NDIS, National Disability Insurance um, Scheme, mm. to help people with that specialist accommodation. So, there, you do see people promoting 10, 12% yields for these. Now, you do have to be super careful. I looked into this myself and decided there was a bit too much risk um, because the SDA providers, um, you've got to find out where the demand is going to be. And they are absolutely super specific built properties for people with high or medium or low care disability services. Now, it does take more time and effort to build these facilities. And again, they can only be used for that purpose. So to convert an SDA house into an ordinary home is going to take a bit of retrofitting. So, you know, and then you're only going to be able to sell to another investor. But the biggest issue I've got around SDA is, is making sure that there are not going to be three or four or 10 more of the same properties built in an area where there's only demand for a limited number of places. Um, so there's a lot more complexity to the background research you need to do. So for that reason, I'm not advocating NDIS type properties because it's too specialised in my view. I can get a better return with lower risk doing other strategies. But what's your thoughts, Terry, on that? Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with everything you've said. It's, it's, you've got to be so particular to get it right. You can't just have a property and say, I'm going to rent it on an S, NDIS basis. It, it has to be um, have all the inclusions that are required by NDIS and they're very, very strict about it. So if you get anything wrong, you'll be disqualified and, and can't actually, if you get it all right, you do get um, very high rental yields potentially. But um, as you say, uh, there are risks and you have to make sure you tick every box if you're going to access that. And um, it, uh, for a lot of people, it's just too hard. But um, the, other, the other factor, of course, is you're providing for a much needed um, community resource we do 
-hmm. have a shortage of um, specialist properties for people with disabilities. So it's sorely needed. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Next one, uh, someone's asking how to check on yield. Um, I think you should be checking on yield minimum once a year. Um, I would be checking on yield pretty much uh, uh, every six months. Um, but you, you need to check your what the rental should be from your property manager. Ask them to send you comparable rents at least two to three months prior to the expiry of your lease. Um, and yeah, it does indicate, well, it does indicate the, the sort of how well your property is doing, but you've got to be looking at the capital growth as well as the yield, not just focus on the yield. And the way to calculate, calculate you know, gross yield is you simply take the rent, times it by 52 uh, weeks in the year and divide it by the purchase price. And that gives you the gross yield. The net yield, you simply take the total rent you get for the year, take off all your expenses, um, including uh, you, you know, your holding costs, uh, your insurances, your rates, your cleaning, your maintenance, and then divide, take that figure times it by 52, and then divide that by the purchase price. And that'll give you your, your net yield. Um, Phil is also asking, we'd like to understand if any serious research has been done understanding what dwellings people want moving forward, given the drive to working from home. Jerry, what, what have you seen on, on special features for working from home in, in the market? You know, it does create a demand for perhaps, um, you know, bigger apartments, for example. Um, I mean, there, there is definitely a trend to downsizing. That's one of the, the powerful forces in the market. But it's not necessarily downsizing in quality. It's downsizing and getting rid of the green bits and, and the stairs for older people. But there's also younger um, cohorts also looking to downsize. But important to have that space where there is a workspace in, in the property. So it does um, create demand for, for larger apartments as one example of, mm. of um, one of the trends. I, I, through conversations with, with property developers who build apartment buildings, they, they're constantly having to reinvent what they do because of the, the new forces in the market, the things that need to be in apartment buildings and in apartments themselves that previously they didn't have to include. Mm. I'm seeing um, uh, not just with apartment builders, but just you know spec builders or home builders, what they call MPR, multi-purpose rooms, are being considered in the planning. And I think we all are going to be working from home one or two days a week. There's the new hybrid uh, type of working. So when you are buying a property or building a property, definitely keep in mind a work from home space and even especially even two work from home spaces because when you've got couples, partners, He's often on a Zoom call like this and you want to be out of earshot of the other person. And I think having extra rooms for that is really, really important. And don't believe the media nonsense about, um, you know, the work from home thing was all caused by COVID. Now we want to go back to the office. This is a much longer term trend that predated COVID. It's all about technology and affordability and lifestyle. Um, you know, I run a business where everyone's in a different part, not, not just a different part of Australia, but people overseas are all part of it. Um, people can be anywhere doing what they do in many cases, not in every job, of course. Mm. Uh, David's asking an economics question here, which I'll answer. Are we already in a recession on a per capita basis uh, with, my, with high migration, keeping retail sales buoyant? Um, no, we're not in a recession yet, uh, not in a technical recession. There's a possibly a 50% chance we might go to a technical recession. But the biggest issue we've got, one of the biggest issues in the economy at the moment is productivity. Um, you know, unemployment is still very, very low. And, but we do need to um, increase productivity to really get the economy growing again. And that's a challenge, getting people back to what their jobs are and thinking differently, thinking outside the square, really getting on with the job of doing what they need to be doing. So I don't believe we're in a recession. I actually don't think we're likely to have one. That's my personal view. I could be wrong. Um, but I think Australia is pretty resilient. Um, we're pretty fortunate with a lot of our uh, commodity markets still being very buoyant. Um, this war in the Ukraine, unfortunately, is really holding up commodity prices to our advantage. But I don't think we're going to hit a recession. Terry, Paul's asking a bit more insight into why rent caps would make the problem worse. What's your what's sort of the argument that he can give to his friends who are giving him grief for owning more properties? Because it will cause um, investor owners to sell and get the hell out of the, the, the rental market. Um, you know, as we discussed earlier, um, the costs of owning real estate have gone up in so many ways. Your interest rates have gone up hugely. Insurances are, are rising. Council rates are rising. All the costs of ownership of the property 
are increasing. Um, and we've been told by some politicians that we should absorb all of that, and not be able to put up the price of the product. And that's unrealistic. It's unrealistic for most people that own rental properties because most of them are just ordinary mum and dad households that own one property. They're not wealthy people. They can't afford to absorb that. So they have to sell. And so the pool of rental properties will diminish. And I'd point you to the um, a situation in Ireland um, where they implemented all of these things. They implemented rental caps. They disallowed negative gearing for investors. They increased capital gains tax on investors. And that created, uh, we've got a rental shortage crisis. They've got a catastrophe because there are there's nothing available for rent. When something does become available, I've seen footage on the television news of queues stretching out the house down the street for a kilometre of people because they're so desperate to find somewhere to rent. That's what happens when you institute things like rental caps. So you make the situation where it's not dealing with the real issue. The real issue is um, a shortage. A rental cap's no use to someone who can't find a rental profit at any price. And I know people in that situation that they're, they're turning up for open houses for rentals and there's 30 other people there and only one of them will be successful. So they've got to do it again and again. They keep missing out. A rental cap isn't helping them. What would help them is more supply. Uh, really good example bringing up uh, Ireland. I was going to mention that, but yeah, you don't. we definitely don't want an Irish situation in our rental market. Um, someone's asking a tax question, which is essentially what name to put the property, whether you buy it in a trust or business name or personal name. Um, the answer for that is simply talk to your tax advisor and it's going to depend on your personal situation. If you buy it in your personal name, you will get the tax-free threshold in every state. If you buy it in a trust or a business, you'll get either no exemption from land tax or you'll get a percentage uh, discount. So it's very important you get advice before you sign your name on a contract to work out what entity to buy it in. And I can refer you to someone if you need a name. Someone's asking about my Umina property. Uh, Dean, happy to chat offline about where that's located. Um, David's asking, what's your opinion of Perth? A lot of buyers age suggesting clients could have a repeat of 2008 with the Chinese economy slowing. Um, yeah, just talk briefly about Perth just for a minute, uh, Terry. I think Perth um, has often been very closely tied to the resources sector. So it tends to fluctuate with its fortune mm. based on whether coal and iron ore is up or down. Uh, but it does seem to be showing a bit of a promising uh, start to the moment. Uh, the challenge for me is it is a long way from everything. Um, so that tyranny of distance has an effect, but it, is, it does have its own market and it does have some upside. What's your view of Perth? Yeah. Look, I think the state government in particular in Western Australia is aware that they have a problem. That they have been so reliant on uh, iron ore mm -hmm. and they have these these big cycles in their economy and probably, and they've worked to address that. And I think they've been successful to a certain degree. So I think um, the Western Australian economy and the Perth property market is less susceptible to the rise and fall of the resources sector than before. They've, they've invested in a lot in infrastructure. They've encouraged the development of other businesses, other business sectors. So I think they're addressing that. And I think Perth is going to be less risky going forward uh, than it has been in the past. I think just in terms of building a balanced portfolio too, Terry, it's important to get exposure, uh, not just concentrate in one market. Um, I think you've got to understand the risks and rewards of where you invest and what that will deliver for you long term. Um, Michael is asking about Woodridge, Hunter Valley and Wagga. Um, Woodridge, obviously, in the Logan area uh, of Brisbane. Um, it's a sort of low to medium demographic area. We've bought in those areas. Again, we've got to be careful where you buy in those areas, Michael, um, and the types of properties you buy in Logan. Um, and for Hunter, definitely really like the Hunter. Again, depends on which part. We prefer Newcastle or as close into Newcastle as possible. But I'd also consider Central Coast, Lake Macquarie um, as areas that's got really strong prospects because it's very close to strong employment nodes. Um, Wagga, um, yeah, Wagga and Albury, uh, Albury Wodonga, yeah, I think they've got potential. I just don't think they have enough um, longer term drivers for me to want to put my money there. I wouldn't, uh, not to say you can't invest there, uh, but for me, I'd be wanting to put my money where I know it's going to deliver a really, really strong growth factor and a good yield factor. Mm. What's your view, Terry, of those areas? Um, Woodward, as you said, part of Logan City, which um, I think has it's got good prospects. You do have to be careful, as you pointed out, what you buy, where you buy it. Woodward is um, 
uh, median price in the mid 400,000s now and rental yields um, getting close to 6%. So it's got that. Its growth record has actually been very good. It's long-term growth average and it's still showing price growth. Um, Hunter, well, I've always been a big fan of the Hunter Valley because of their strength and diversity of the economy. It's association with Newcastle, which is one of our biggest cities. And um, yeah, the, just, just the diversity there. It's, there's so many different factors to the economy and it, um, it keeps it uh, consistently strong. I like Wagga because it also has diversity. It's got a strong military economy, isn't it? You know, it's mm -hmm. got a RAF base and an army base, which is a big, huge extra element to its economy, as well as being you know, a strong regional city with agriculture around it and the education economy. It's still affordable. Um, it's got good prospects. Now, for people who are in a particular price range and you know, can, maybe can't afford to buy in the bigger cities, places like Wagga Wagga do present a decent alternative that's affordable with a reasonable growth prospects mm. as well. Cool. Uh, Craig's asking about rooming houses. Do you prefer the studio style apartment over just a room with shared facilities? Um, I prefer to get um, the rooming houses that have got their own internal um, uh, bathrooms because what tends to happen is people keep to themselves. They don't tend to hang out together in the common room. So people go into their rooms. It's better they have their own bedroom and own living space. And that's just it. They just have their own own space to be. So the shared facilities one, they can work, but I don't believe they get as high a rental return as you'd get from having ones with their own independent facilities. Um, Diana's asking Terry, hotspot investment locations for Melbourne. Uh, well, that's a whole topic of another webinar, but <laughs> what do you, what's your thoughts on Melbourne briefly? Yeah, well, I mean, my opinion, going back to the question right at the start of the broadcast, I think the, the Premier of Victoria is doing his absolute best to completely stuff it up for Melbourne and Victoria in so many different ways. The economy is struggling. Um, they've got a lot of debt. Um, they've introduced, introduced some changes like to land tax, which are not helpful for property investors and are going to make their rental shortage worse. But Melbourne, nevertheless, is, um, well, depending on whose figures you believe, it's now our largest... Um, capital city, um, according to some definitions of where Melbourne is and where Sydney is. Um, it's um, generally a strong economy. It gets a lot of uplift from overseas migration, which is a big factor again, and from overseas students coming in, hot spots. Um, look, I, one, of the, one of the paradigm shifts, and I, we did an earlier webinar about this, uh, Rich, is, it, it relates to apartments becoming more and more a viable alternative for people to consider. Mm. I think um, in Melbourne, there's evidence of rising demand for apartments in suburbs clustered around the CBD of Melbourne, where houses might be $2 million, but you can get apartments for six or 700000 That That makes a lot of sense to me. And we're actually working on um, a new report which, which deals with that, that aspect. Um, and then there's some very good middle ring areas um, and the outer ring areas. I like the city of Hume as an affordable area in Melbourne, up in the north. There's lots of big job nodes up in the north. Affordable property, great transport links. So it ticks a lot of boxes for people. Mm, great. Um, someone anonymous asking, how do you pick a buyer's agent? There are a couple that have extensive computer algorithms to back decisions. Would you find these reputable and reliable as they argue they have more, a far more effective approach? Yeah, great question. Um, I think when you're picking your buyer's agent, a couple of things that independently I would say you need to look for. One is, can you trust them? Um, look at their reputation. Make sure they're licensed in the state that you're buying in is really important. Make sure they've got an extensive network to find off-market properties, not just on-market properties. And having those local agent relationships and making sure their buyer's agents or people in their team work and live in those local areas is really critical. Um, as for the algorithm, yeah, absolutely. Make sure that a lot of their data is, is backed up, is independent. So we use Terry's data, for example. Um, we also use Suburbs Finder, Microburbs, and a number of other data sources, including CoreLogic and other our own internal data sources. So we don't just rely on one data source. We are very data-driven. Me being an economist, I like to analyze things myself. Um, so it's important that you also connect with the buyer's agent and know that they've got your best interests at heart. So have a look at you know a bunch of them, but at the end of the day, you've got to work with someone you connect with and that you end up trusting. So have those, ask the hard questions, um, and you don't always go for the cheapest or most expensive. You know, look for one that provides good value for service and has got good reputation. Yeah. Um, 
Shanley's asking, in terms of capital growth, does Resi usually outperform commercial property? Oh, it's a tough one. Terry, how would you answer that question? Yeah, it's, it's a very generalised question and a very generalised answer is that the rule of thumb is that residential generally does outperform one capital growth. But of course, you know, there are so many exceptions. Um, um, I, I think it's, it's, not, it's not even worth considering that question. It's, it's all about the individual property you buy. Does it, does it tick the boxes you're looking at? Commercial property can give you great cash flow, high yield. If you buy the right one, you're going to get capital growth as well. If you consider the, the, the underlying economy in the location in which it sits, that's the important thing. Um, so, I mean, you, you can get everything you want from residential property, high yield capital growth, but you can also get that from commercial if you choose it well. Which I'd just like to refer back to the, the previous question about buyers agents. There are, there are a million people out there um, pretending to be buyers agents, calling themselves buyers agents who don't necessarily have any experience or knowledge, aren't necessarily offering anything to people. You've got to be very, very careful that you're getting a genuine one with a team, with experience, with good information. There's even people out there who are working for selling agents, calling themselves buyer's agents. And you've got to be wary of that. I got an email from one of those just the other day saying, I'm, I'm a buyer's agent and here, here's one of our listings. <laughs> right. um, conflict yeah. of interest written all over that. Yeah. Conflict of interest, um, unethical and probably illegal. Um, so you, you do have to be careful who you choose um, because there are so many, a lot of people out there think that being a buyer's agent is a really easy way to make lots of money um, and, and it's not. Um, it requires a lot of hard work. It requires a lot of expertise to be a good one and a successful one. So um, get a recommendation from someone who's had a good or bad experience and um, be guided by that. Um, Jamie's asking, you mentioned you'd advise investors to grow their resi por portfolio before going to commercial. Is this based on having a better experience or just the financial difference? Yeah, the good question, Jamie. It is based on the individual circumstances and the financial risk of getting into commercial. If you don't own any other property and you get into a commercial property, as I mentioned before, without um, a tenant or having a vacancy period, that can really affect you. Whereas if you own a resi property, and the tenant leaves, you can adjust the rent by 20 or $50 a week and quickly get somebody else. So that's the main reason I provided that advice. Um, Jagadesh says, in the same way in DIS accommodation, would you say there are same issues rooming houses if demand falls? No, I think Jagadesh, um, rooming houses has much wider appeal um, to the broader rental market than does NDIS. NDIS is probably you know 0.5 percent or less of the rental market, and it's a very specific particular niche area. Whereas rooming houses provide singular room accommodation for people. So again, it is just important to buy an investment for a rooming house in an area where you know there's going to be consistent demand. Um, Adams, I'm just looking at time, Terry. I think we'll just do a couple more, then we'll wrap up. Um, when you say you can get high growth and high rental yield, what sort of return would you be expecting in the current market? Well, let's look at this. I think, you know, Adam, it depends on the location. So like a house in Melbourne, for example, we can get, say, a 4% gross rental yield. Combine that with, say, an 8% capital growth rate, your total returns 12%. Um, Brisbane, we can get, say, an average of five, five and a half percent rental return on a house. Add that to, say, a 12, sorry, a seven percent capital growth rate, and you're pretty similar, maybe 12 and a half percent. So, again, that the sort of return, the total return of gross yield plus capital growth, definitely want to be over 10 percent. Um, and you can be even up to 15 percent, depending on the location where you're buying. Um, Adam's asking, or oh, what would you personally accept as a minimum hurdle rate for your own purchase? Yeah, 10% is what I would say. Again, depends on location. We've talked a bit about Victoria, uh, talked about NDIS. Terry, is there any others there you want to quickly jump on? Gosford. Um, Natalie's asking about Adelaide. Um, it has been overlooked and underrated in the past. Um, probably no more. It's um, you know, a serious player in the both in the economic life of Australia and in the property market. Um, South Australia is now the number two ranked economy in the country, according to the Comsec State of the States report. Um, we've observed that rise and we're a big fan of Adelaide. Still, it's had some great growth, but still relatively affordable and you can get some pretty good rental returns, particularly up in those northern suburbs. 
Um, so I, th I think there's a big future um, for the Adelaide property market. And it's a good place to own real estate, I think, going forward. Cool. Look, we are just over time, Terry. Can I just say a big thank you so much for helping me out today and presenting co-presenting the webinar with me on Chasing High Yield. Thank you to all of our audience. We really appreciate you logging on, participating. Hope we've answered enough of your questions. Um, we will be sending out a copy of the recording to everyone, uh, plus a connection, well, a list of our slides as well. So if you would like to reach out to Terry for his research reports or to my company, Property Buyer, to help you in finding a suitable property or having a strategy chat, we'd love to connect with you. Um, so just please reply to the email or reach out to us directly. But can I just say thanks again, and we look forward to seeing you again very soon. Thanks, Terry. You're welcome, Rich.